So with this problem, we have a uh, shaft that is simply supported at its ends. Okay, mentioned there that these are pillow block bearings. Uh, if you ever see a, a phrase like that, you can interpret that to mean that there will not be uh, moments reacted at the location where those bearings um, are, uh, are applied. And we have this one inch diameter steel shaft that extends from one of those bearings to the other bearing and then has three different uh, masses applied to it. So these would be like three different shaft components that might be uh, implemented onto the shaft like this, okay? And what we want to do is we want to determine what the safe uh, operating speed is for this shaft um, if everything is basically concentric, right? We, we're basically saying we did as good a job as we could balancing the shaft uh, and all of the masses that are attached to the shaft prior to putting it in service and spinning it up. If there's actually known uh, eccentricities to the centers of mass of any of these parts, then uh, we would actually expect that we would be able to operate it at much lower speed than what we're about to predict right now. So that's why that's important. But even if we get everything as, as best we know uh, balanced so that the, all of our CGs are at the centers, uh, there is still a risk that can happen with shafts. And that risk is that the shaft can start um, you know, vibrating, uh, especially if we drive the shaft at a speed that is close to its resonant frequency. All right, this is a little bit trickier problem because we have to correctly account for all of the masses that are applied to the shaft. Every time you put a mass on the shaft like this, it has a tendency to reduce the, uh, you know, that resonant frequency that it might be at. And at some point, the resonant frequency can be low enough that it might be within the range that you would want to spin the shaft and uh, then you can start, you know, because you're driving the shaft at a similar speed to what its resonant frequency is, it ends up creating a situation where you uh, continue to add energy into the shaft and that th at some point it will vibrate too far and, and something will break, okay? So we're gonna use a method uh, that is presented in back in chapter seven. Um, and they actually go very much in depth into the derivation of this method. And uh, they show a lot of things and, and some of what they show you there is how you can get um, other uh, frequencies beyond just kind of the lowest fundamental frequency. Um, I am not gonna require that you get, you know, kind of super intimately uh, familiar with all of that stuff because what matters to us the most in terms of machine design is finding that lowest uh, fundamental frequency because that's the one that we need to design around. We would need to make sure that we don't get close to that lowest fundamental frequency or else it'll start causing there to be large deflections and uh, possible, um, you know, possible breakage of things because of this continual addition of energy into the system. We're gonna use a uh, technique that involves things that are called influence coefficients. Okay, so let me just go ahead and kind of tell you what these little deltas are that I'm going to be dealing with here. This is an influence coefficient. Okay, an influence coefficient, actually one way of thinking about it is um, it's, it's a little bit like a spring constant, only it's flipped the other direction, okay? It's basically... Um, how much deflection you have in a shaft uh, for a unit of force. So I'll just write it this way, for a unit force. Okay, so if you put one unit of force on there, how much will it deflect? And uh, they actually go into a pretty good bit of detail here, mentioning the fact that since a shaft has mass distributed along its length and sort of uh, its, its um, deflections will also distribute uh, along its length according to its, its elastic curve, once you put a uh, unit force, let's say at the location where the 17 pound weight is over here, it will not only cause a deflection at that point, it will also cause deflections um, at any other point where masses are applied. And that's, that's what causes some of the complication 
of the method that is presented there in the book. Okay, now I'm going to help you out a little bit and say all that is very interesting, but where we care about this is right at the very end of this section. Okay, right at the very end of this section, it presents a method whereby we can um, take the influence of each one of these weights that's applied to the shaft and transform it so that it uh, has the same effect as a weight that you apply at the very center of the shaft. And by basically coming up with the equivalent weight that you would apply to the center of the shaft for each of these weights, it gives us a method where we can just add all those weights up once we figure out what the equivalent would be at the center and, uh, and use that. Okay, so that's the big idea of what we're about to do. I want to show you uh, equation 733. Okay, equation 733 says uh, weight sub 1c. Okay, it uses a lowercase uh, letter w uh, with sub subscript of 1 and then another subscript of c. Okay, what this variable is right here, this is this equivalent weight that you are going to uh, calculate for each of the weights that's here as if it was applied at the center of the shaft rather than at the locations where they are actually attached to the shaft. All right. Um, so let me just ask this. Do you feel like a, uh, this is kind of for the intuition side of it. Do you feel like a 17 pound weight is going to have the same effect in terms of lowering this frequency where it's applied, or, it's going to, or if you put 17 pounds right at the middle, would that have a greater effect? Yeah, the middle is kind of your worst case scenario. The closer you go to the middle for a shaft like this, it, it creates a worse situation in terms of lowering the, uh, the resonant frequency of the shaft. Okay, And so what we're doing actually is we're saying um, this 17 pounds does cause a lowering of the resonant frequency but not as much as if it had been at the center. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what weight would you have to put at the center to create the same effect of lowering this resonant frequency as putting the 17 pound over where it is. Okay, so I, I understand that's a little bit, uh, it's kind of a lot to process all at once, but that's kind of the big idea of what we're trying to do, and that's what this equation does. It says the way you do that is you uh, take the weight that is actually applied at the position where it's actually applied, and you multiply it by uh, the influence coefficient, and they put a double subscript on here, 1, 1. Okay? What the subscript 1, 1 means, this is basically the influence coefficient at location 1 of a force applied at location 1. So in other words, it's the amount of deflection happening at location 1 due to a force applied at location one. So that's why the dual subscript there. Um, and then it puts another one here that's uh, delta sub cc. What do you think that might be? Okay, it's kind of the same idea. It's the influence coefficient at the center of the shaft as if a force was being applied at the center of the shaft. All right, and these influence coefficients are uh, functions they're not functions of force because you pulled the force out of it. You're saying it's for a unit force, right? So it's function only of the geometry of the shaft as well as the elasticity of the shaft. And we can find what these are. Um, a page back, it tells you that for a simply supported shaft, this is equation 724, okay? It tells you that the influence coefficients uh, are given with an expression there, 724, um, and it gives them to you both at the location where the force is being applied as well as if you move to one side or to the other side. Well, what I want to show you here is where they got that equation. Um, that's equation 724. What they did is they went and they looked at these uh, elastic equations that we have in the very back of the book. And the reason I want to do this is to kind of show you that it doesn't, you aren't limited to only do this for a uh, simply supported shaft, this, this works as long as you can come up with what the elastic curve is of the shaft. So equation 724 um, actually arises from table A9 in the back of the book, case 
Uh, shoot, I was looking at the wrong one. Table A9, case uh, 6. It says simple supports, intermediate load. And you might see there that um, it tells you that your Y value, okay, might say YAB, is equal to FBX uh, over 6EIL. Okay. And uh, this is all going to be multiplied by x squared plus b squared minus l squared. Okay. Now, if you go back and look at equation 724, we have almost exactly this same uh, equation. All right. But there is one thing that's a little bit different, maybe two things that are a little bit different. Okay, what are those two things? Okay, this is, this here was from table uh, A9. Okay, and then over here we're going to do equation uh, 724. Okay, equation 724, we're going to look at the first part of it, and we're going to say that delta uh, ij... is going to be equal to B sub J uh, X I over 6 E I L. Okay, and the, uh, the shaft that they show in the picture above where they give that equation is set up just like the one that's in the back of the book, uh, at least for the most part. And then, but they multiply it by L squared minus B sub J squared uh, minus X sub I squared. Okay, so what's different? Okay, force goes away. That's because it's an influence coefficient as opposed to, right, we're, we're assuming a unit force. So that's why that force value goes away. Um, but what else changed? Okay. Yeah, this right here is the negative of this right here. Why do you think that is? Okay. Yeah, it's the orientation of the deflection, right? The Y that we had right here, um, this was positive downward. And this over here was positive upward. Okay, so that's why we're going to take that and just, you know, rearrange those a little bit and because we want a positive value to come out of that. Okay, so... How do I come up then with what my equivalent weight is for a given one of these weights? Okay, we'll, we'll start with, let me tell you what, I'll, I'll number these. I'll say this is one, this will be two, and this will be three. Okay, so we'll start with one. Okay. W sub 1 sub C is going to be equal to, how do I implement this influence coefficient? All right, it's fairly simple, okay. What is the B value? It actually doesn't... It doesn't really matter uh, which one you use as the B value. It's just the length from one end to the location where we put uh, this force on there. Okay. So um, the reason it doesn't matter is that we are coming up with the influence coefficient at the uh, same location as where we are assuming the force is applied, where the same location where the unit force is being applied. And so uh, what we can do there is put in 
um, a B value of 31 inches, okay, me basically measuring it from the opposite end over here. So 25 inches plus 6 uh, gives you 31 inches. Okay, and I'm going to make a fairly big expression here, so I'll start here. 31 inches, and then what is X? Okay, X is measured from the opposite end from where the B is shown. Okay, you'll see that on the, uh, whether you're looking at the picture on page 376, figure 713, or whether you're looking at the figure in the back of the book, you're going to be measuring X from the opposite end from the, direct, from the end that you're measuring B. Okay, so we put in 5 inches. Okay, all this over 6 E I L. All right, what's E? Okay, modulus of elasticity for steel, it's 30 times 10 to the 6th PSI. That's from table A5 in the back. Um, I, how do I calculate I? Okay, it's a round cross section, right? And to calculate I, we would take pi times the diameter to the fourth over 64. And what's L? Okay, the total length of the shaft is 36 inches. Okay, then what? 36 inches squared minus the B that we have there was 31 uh, inches squared minus 5 inches squared. Okay, and this is all the numerator. What I just calculated right there, this, all of this stuff up in the numerator is delta 1, 1. That's my influence coefficient for a force applied at location one. Um, you know, it's the, it's the influence co coefficient at location one of a force applied at location one. Okay. But then I have to divide by what? Okay. How do I get delta CC? Very similar thing. Only thing that I change now is I imagine kind of a fictitious weight that would be applied right at the middle of this thing, right? So, you know, maybe somewhere right in here. Imagine that we're going to lump a whole bunch of weight right here, and we're going to find an equivalent weight that we lump right there so that it has the same uh, resonance effect as the combination of these three that we have right now, okay? And that is, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll label it C, right? Um, because that's what we're talking about is the center of the shaft. Okay, well, how far is it to the center of the shaft? Okay, 18 inches, right? All right, so what we do here is we put in 18 inches. 18 inches, 18 inches because that's going to be both, um, you know, the same dimension to both sides. Down here, we still have 6 EIL. All right, and L is 36 inches. And over here, we do 36 inches squared minus 18 inches squared minus 18 inches squared. Okay. Now, what do you notice about this expression? This denominator right here is the same as this one right here. So they cancel. All right, there is, you know, 
It doesn't mean there's no reason uh, that it needs to be there. It still needs to be there for this to really be an influence coefficient. And we might see in just a moment or two uh, that it still matters, okay? But uh, W1C ultimately then becomes, if I actually punch in these numbers, uh, W1C ends up being 3.891 pounds. I believe that is correct. Sorry, I've, I've left out a term. <coughs> so uh, an astute observer here said, we shouldn't leave out the fact that we had W1 here, right? So we have to put in uh, 17 pounds. Appreciate that. Okay, so this ends up giving us um, 3.891 uh, pounds. Okay, so that is basically how much contribution the 17 pound weight gives if we were going to lump it at the middle in terms of what it does to the resonant frequency of the shaft. How do you think we handle the other two? Okay. Let's, I'll do one of them so you can see, um, you know, what changes. Okay. <clears throat> what changes when we go to the seven pound force or, or uh, weight that's applied to the shaft right there at position two, uh, we now have 25 inches for the factor of B. We will have 11 inches for this X, okay? The 36 inches stays the same, but we've changed the 25 or the 31 to 25 here and the 5 to 11, okay? And then over here, the 17 changes to 7, and this gives us the equivalent weight for weight number 2 as if it was applied at the center. Okay, that's the only stuff that, that needs to actually change in order to come up with this last weight, okay? And uh, this turns out to be 5.043 pounds. Which is interesting, right? This seven pounds, it's uh, 10 pounds lighter than the one that we did first, but it has more of an influence on lowering the resonant frequency of the shaft than the 17 pounds that we had and the reason why is that the 17 pound weight was applied closer to one of the supports, right? So that's, um, that's just an interesting outcome, I'll say. All right, how would we do the last one? Okay, you do the same thing again. Uh, the only thing that changes when you move to the last one is you put in a weight value equals 12 pounds, um, B equals, what would that one be in that case? Okay, you can do it two different ways. I mean, basically X and B kind of end up becoming interchangeable. So you can put in 12 um, and then what would the other side be? 12 and 24, okay. So B could be 24 uh, inches, okay, and X could be 12 inches. And what you end up with is that W3C will be 9.481 pounds. And what's really nice about this whole method how easy is this to increase to n number of attachments that you have on the shaft, 
right? Super easy, right? You just go to each one of the attachments uh, or you know components that you have installed on the shaft and do another one of these calculations. Um, and what you do when once you have all of these is you put them all together into a total equivalent weight, all right? I'll say total lumped weight at the center, okay? It is just equal to 3.891 pounds plus 5.043 pounds plus 9.481 pounds. Okay. And if you add those up, you get 18.415 pounds. All right, so what we just came up with is a total amount of weight that we could replace the actual weights that exist on this shaft. We could replace all of those with an equivalent weight of 18.415 pounds. And now the uh, resonance uh, tendencies of the shaft should be equivalent, at least for that first fundamental frequency, uh, for this simplified shaft where we just have one weight at the center. Um, and so that, you know, that's really nice. Well, now what we do, now that we have this total uh, lumped weight at the center, we're going to go back again to equation 733, but we're going to move uh, to a different part of that equation. I kind of wish that they had numbered these equations with two different numbers. But if you look at the line before the one that we just started using there, it gives another expression that says omega squared sub 1, 1. And one of the expressions of omega squared sub 1, 1 is uh, W1C delta CC. With a... Uh, acceleration due to gravity in the numerator, okay? So this is, again, equation 733, and maybe I'll put in here first line. Okay, so the first line of that equation gives you that. How do you think that's useful? Okay, the omega that I have over here, this is a shaft speed, right? And it's telling you that the uh, resonant frequency due to the fact, or, or due to the weight that is applied at position one, right? And the influence that that weight at position one has because of its location at position one, um, that squared is equal to gravity over the uh, equivalent weight for one, uh, as if it was at the center, times the influence coefficient uh, at the center. Well, here's how this is useful, right? What we can do is we can say now that the influence for weight, uh, the overall weight, see the overall equivalent weight, okay, is going to be equal to the square root of What? G, okay, so 32.2 feet per second squared, okay. This gets divided by the weight uh, sub CC, right, the, kind of this total lumped weight of 18.415. times the influence coefficient um, for the, uh, a weight that would be applied at the center of the shaft, all right? So that would be 18 inches times 18 inches uh, over, okay, 
6 times e uh, times pi times 1 inch to the fourth over 64. Okay, and then all of this gets multiplied by 36 inches uh, minus, oh, and that would be squared minus 18 inches squared minus 18 inches squared. Let me, uh, Yes, someone said, does there need to be an L on the denominator of that influence coefficient? So appreciate you guys keeping me on track here. I missed a term right here, should be 36 inches. Okay, um, the question that was just asked is how is it that that delta CC is the same here as the denominator that we had in the conditions where we were looking at individual weights? And it's a good question. It's because it is the same parameter. If you go up here and look at how we were calculating those, delta CC is the influence coefficient for a weight applied at the center, all right? It's the influence coefficient of the location at the center for a weight that's applied at the center, all right? That's what the C and the C mean, is that um, we're looking at that particular location right at the center of the shaft. It is the same number as now that we are looking at the lumped weight. We are now looking at that lumped weight being the weight that's applied there at the center, right? So it's still the same delta CC. All right, and that's kind of a big old messy thing. Uh, one of the things I will point out to you here is that we do have one units problem um, in, uh, in how this thing all breaks apart. Um, the pounds you might see here will cancel with the pounds in the PSI, right? So that's not really our issue. We don't have to go into slugs and all that. What, what is our issue though? Okay. Yeah, it ends up giving us a, uh, a feet up here where all of the rest of our, our units are, were, were in inches. And so I need to multiply this by 12 inches per foot in order to make it work out, okay? Influence coefficients, what kind of a unit comes out of an influence coefficient? Okay, an influence coefficient is how far it deflects for a unit load. So the units on an influence coefficient are gonna be length, right? And that, uh, based on the fact that we use nothing but inches as length units in this, it means that the length unit's gonna come out in inches uh, for this whole influence coefficient that I put in right there, and that cancels out the inches uh, in the 12 inches per foot. The foot cancels out the foot right there. What do I end up with for my units out of this expression? Okay, one over second squared is what comes out of the, the inside the radical. Then you take the radical and it gives you one over seconds. How do we interpret that? Okay, this one's different, all right? This one, we do not interpret that as hertz, okay? Um, with this one, this is a value that ends up being in radians per second, okay? So omega overall uh, equivalent weight. Let me give that to you here. This turns out to be 178.3 radians per second. Okay, and if you're curious what that is, um, this is 1702.6 RPM. All 
All right. Well, my question now is, are we done? OK. Let me ask you this. Did we account for all of the mass in this system? We didn't, OK? Well, the problem that we just solved was for a fictitious material for our shaft that somehow has stiffness with no weight. All right? So that's nice if you could actually make something that's like that, that's, that has stiffness with no weight. But that's not real, right? Our, our actual materials also have weight. So what I want to show you now is how do you incorporate the, uh, you know, the weight of the shaft? The weight of the shaft is different than all the stuff we just dealt with here because the weight of the shaft is not concentrated. It's distributed, right? And so what I want to do here is show you a, another equation that's in this section. It's earlier in the section, okay? It says um, when the geometry of a shaft is simple, um, such as something that has a uniform diameter uh, and is simply supported, the task is easy of coming up with the uh, resonant frequency of just the shaft, and it gives you an expression to find it there. That expression, which I'm going to name omega shaft, and I'm going to go back to black here, omega shaft, is going to be equal to pi over L squared times the square root of uh, G E I over A gamma. Okay, this is equation 722. And what you're finding with this equation, this is if you had a shaft that had nothing supported on it, right? No components installed on the shaft. This is just the shaft itself. And so um, what we're going to do here is uh, plug in our, no our known values that we have for our shaft. The, you know, pi obviously is what it is. 36 inches is the length, okay? G is 32.2 feet per second squared. E, 30 times 10 to the sixth PSI. I is pi times one inch to the fourth over 64. Okay. And then down in the, in the denominator, what do you think A is? Yep, it's cross-sectional area for the shaft. And so that would just be given with pi times the diameter squared over 4. All right, and then gamma. Okay, we looked up... Um, a value for steel earlier. Um, it's in uh, it's in table A5. Uh, that's in the back of the book, and that value is 0.282 pounds per cubic inch. Okay. And this expression works kind of similarly in that all of the length units will cancel out and the pounds will cancel out with the pounds of PSI. And what kind of units do you end up with? Okay. Actually, out of the radical, not all the length units cancel. What do you think you're left with out of the radical? Okay. You end up with a uh, length squared, but that cancels with the length squared that we have for this value that's outside the radical. Okay. Um, do we need to do any sort of a conversion in order to make the length units inside the radical uh, work with each other? Okay. 12 inches per foot needs to be in there so that we get rid of our uh, feet per second squared. The 
32.2. All right. So this is, we, we have a bit of an issue now. We have a, uh, a value for what this resonant frequency would be if all we had was uh, these discrete weights that are applied at different locations onto a shaft that had stiffness but no weight. And then what we just came up with here is a shaft that has no weights applied to it but has its own self-weight. And we came up with two different values. I guess I haven't actually told you what this turns out to be. Um, I have it calculated at 386 radians per second. Okay. And this is, if you want to know, this is uh, 3686 RPM. Okay, so now what we need to do is combine these together somehow. And where we look for that is at the bottom of page 377. Okay, um, the bottom of page 377, it says one over the resonant frequency is equal to the sum of one over each of the resonant frequencies that we find if we're finding you know, kind of the combination of multiple uh, resonant frequencies. All right, so how does that pop out of here? Well, it just looks like this. My overall, okay, is going to be equal to the square root of one over, I'll do this in terms of RPMs here, 1702.6 RPM. squared plus 1 over 3686 RPM. And this is actually, um, make sure I don't tell you wrong, this, uh, this should have been 1 over this, All right? So 1 over my overall um, speed that I, that, you know, where my resonance happens for my shaft is equal to this expression. Okay, and that turns out to be 1547.7 RPM. So I'm gonna ask a similar question um, if this is overall, if we, this is counting for the mass of the attached parts as well as the mass of the shaft itself, this is the kind of the resonant speed, the critical speed of the shaft. That's what they call it, critical speed. Question is, do you want to run it at the critical speed? Not a good idea. All right, you, you don't want to do that um, because if you start running it at a critical speed, you might end up seeing large deflections uh, in the shaft. It will vibrate uh, and it may start vibrating out of control. So what I want to point your attention to is uh, on page 375, right in around the middle of the page, it says... Um, there's a sentence right at the end of the first paragraph in this section. It says, designers seek first critical speeds at least twice the operating speed. All right. So what does that mean that we should recommend for an operating speed? Okay, the maximum allowable operating speed is going to be equal to 1547.7 RPM over 2. And that just gives us 772.9. Okay.
So do I have any questions about that process? Uh, yeah, sorry, I should have I should have made this like this. Thank you. That someone pointed out this isn't actually what this equals. Um, this implies that my overall speed is 1547.7. Thank you for that. All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So you drill a hole in one of the gears and it makes it to where it is um, off balance, right? Um, well, the best I can tell you is it makes the situation worse <laughs> um, and you don't want to use this technique anymore. This is a technique that's designed to, you know, figure this out if you feel like you have it all balanced the best you possibly can, all right? Um, you know, once you, once you have a known imbalance in your shaft, um, it, it creates a worse situation. And that's, I, I won't be able to tell you how to analyze that with this technique. This is if you think you have it balanced. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, I will see you guys next time. <laughs>